And now it's my great pleasure to introduce historian, journalist, publisher, television commentator, and best-selling author, John Meacham. <laughs> Mr. Meacham received the Pulitzer Prize in 2009 for the biography, American Lion, Andrew Jackson in the White House. Among his other critically and popularly acclaimed works of nonfiction are American Gospel, God, the Founding Fathers, and the Making of a Nation, and Thomas Jefferson, The Art of Power. Currently executive editor and executive vice president at Random House, he was formerly editor and chief of Newsweek. In the soul of America, John Meacham provides a context and perspective on our country's current political climate by re revisiting critical periods in our past when using Abraham Lincoln's prophetic term, the better angels of our nature defeated fear and division. Uh, Newsday declares Meacham by chronicling the nation's struggles from revolutionary times to current day makes the resonant argument that America has faced division before and not only survived, but thrived. We are so pleased to have him here with us this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming John Meacham to the Free Library. Thank you. Thank you. The, uh, this must be, um, I should come here more often because that <laughs> never happens anywhere else. Uh, Thank you. Uh, there was a very generous introduction, and I was just, I was thinking, um, I told the part of the story at Barbara Bush's funeral not long ago, but uh, about a decade ago, I was on the Washington Mall at the National Book Festival, and a woman ran up to me, which doesn't happen enough, and, or ever, actually, and said, oh my God, it's you. And I said, well, yes, you know, that's hard to argue with. And, she said, I just, I love your book so much. Will you wait right here? I want you to sign your new book. And I said, yes, ma'am. And I stood there thinking, this is exactly the way the world is supposed to be. She brought back John Grisham's latest. Oh, so. Next day, true story. Next day, that was a Saturday. I went up to Maine. I was working on the book about President Bush at the time. And I was having lunch with the senior Bushes. And I told this story. And Mrs. Bush looks across the table in a kind of concerned way, and I'm expecting some motherly reassurance. And she said, well, how do you think poor John Grisham would feel? You know, you know, he's a very handsome man. So it was just, it was a bad weekend all around. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. There, there's yet a third chapter of that story now. I got a note from Grisham a couple of weeks ago saying that his wife had just received a sympathy note because some viewer thought I was speaking at his funeral. So, and so, so it gives on forever. Um, first of all, I want to thank Philadelphia for the Constitution. We're, we're taking it out for a spin. Uh, um, but... You all did well, so we're going we're gonna to test it uh, as, as, hard as, as hard as we can. Um, I want to talk about uh, the current book. I'm going to try not to mention Voldemort too much, uh, because my, my sense of things is that you all know what you think about him. Uh, you're probably more interested in the place this moment falls in the spectrum of history. And so we're not going to talk about those hearings, although if there was ever a case for sending Congress home, that was pretty close uh, this afternoon. But um, I, already, I already fell off the wagon. I'm sorry. That didn't, that didn't take long. Um, but I started writing this book right after the events in Charlottesville of last August, when uh, you may remember there were neo-Nazis and Klansmen marching in, in Charlottesville to defend a Robert E. Lee statue. And there were counter protesters. One of the counter protesters was killed. And the President of the United States had a hard time figuring out whose side he was on. And to me, that was a singular failure of moral leadership. And it got me thinking even more specifically about where, to what extent is this unprecedented? To what extent have we been here before? And what can the answers to those questions, insofar as we can arrive at an answer, what can that tell us about how we get through this one? Because 
America was not perfect prior to November 2016. There are a lot of people, most of them listen to NPR, and most of them are probably here, <laughs> and you know who you are, who think that we have, if we haven't gone off the precipice, we are certainly a strong wind will blow us over. Okay, but the incumbent is not an entirely new force in American life. If we think he's a new force, two things happen, two bad things happen. One is we foreclose the capacity to learn from what's come before. The other is I think we do a disservice to the people who fought so hard, who often gave their lives, to force us to continue that journey toward a more perfect union. Rosa Parks and John Lewis and Martin Luther King and Alice Parks and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Frederick Douglass, they weren't living in a pre-lapsarian Edenic world. They were living in a flawed and sinful and broken America, and they were doing all they could to make it a better place. That's the story of the country. I don't need to tell people in Philadelphia that because this is where it started. The great legacy of the, con of the American Revolution, and this is what I try to say to my conservative friends, and I live in Tennessee, so they're the only friends I have. Um, <laughs> it's that or I'm Boo Radley, you know. Uh, this is a learned crowd, okay. Um, if, if you're laughing at Boo Radley on a Thursday, y'all are, y'all, you need to get out more, <laughs> is one thing. But um, is, I think if we continue to think that either he is the embodiment of evil or the embodiment of good, and that's kind of where most of the country is, right? We, we've really never been, in, since the 1850s, we have not been as reflexively partisan as we are now. That is true. And I, what I try to say to conservative folks is that's not being true. Reflexive partisanship is not being true to the American Revolution as it continues to unfold. Because what was the American Revolution, if not the clearest political manifestation of the most important shifts that were going on in the Western world in the previous three or 400 years? Can you all hear me? Did it fade? Okay. Um, all right. There we go. That was Thomas Jefferson. Uh, uh, what had been going on when Jefferson sat down not far from here to write what became the most important sentence in the English language, that all men were created equal? And I hesitate to make an exorbitant claim like that about the language, although I, do, I would like to remind you of the great story about the Texas school board candidate who gave a speech opposing Spanish, teaching Spanish in the public schools, saying that if English was good enough for our Lord Jesus Christ, it was good enough for Texas. <laughs> so there's always... <laughs> When you're a Tennessee and you always say, thank God for Texas. Uh, so what had been going on? Uh, well, in 1455, Gutenberg introduces movable type. The information becomes democratized. The Protestant reformations, the rise of the bourgeoisie, the scientific revolution, the European enlightenment, the Scottish moral enlightenment, an entire reorientation of the world from being organized vertically where popes and princes and prelates and kings, who either by an accident of birth or an incident of election, had authority over all of us, was giving way to a more horizontal understanding that we were born with the capacity to determine our own destinies. The American Revolution is the clearest and most enduring legacy of that shift. I think it's the most important shift that happened in, uh, in Western life since Constantine converted to Christianity. And it continues to unfold. The digital revolution is not new. It's the continuing chapter in the saga of power flowing from the hands of the few to the hands of the many. And so if you're going to be true to the revolution, what was it that we offered that was particular in that late 18th century operation, enterprise? It was that reason should have a chance to stand in the arena against passion. That we were sinful, we were driven by appetite and ambition, we were going to do the wrong thing quite as often, if not more so, than we did the right thing. 
And so we produced a constitution that is an entirely Calvinistic document. It assumes that we're going to screw everything up. And that was a pretty safe assumption. This moment now is what they were protecting against. This is a stress test for citizenship. It's a stress test for the Constitution itself. They were ready for a demagogue. They were thinking about Aaron Burr or Patrick Henry. It took a while. I think they would have been stunned if they were told, you know what, it's not going to be till 2016 that we really have someone who's going to do this, who's going to present these challenges. But the Constitution, I think, is going to come through this, and it comes th it's going to have to come through it if we, the people, continue to speak up, continue to agitate, continue to say day to day, even hour to hour, that, as George Herbert Walker Bush said in a different context, this will not stand. So that's, I think, the historical context of the moment. We have been in about three different eras, as divided, as fractious, as contentious, as pessimistic as we are now. I want to run through them very quickly. The chief one really begins right after the Civil War, right after Appomattox. Appomattox marked a beginning, not an end. Robert Penn Warren wrote that this, the Confederacy was never more successful than at the moment when Lee handed his sword to Grant because it was going to live on as an idea. There's a journalist named Edward Alfred Pollard, who was a Richmond uh, Confederate, who wrote a book published in January 1866 called The Lost Cause, A New History of the Southern War. Well, there wasn't any old history. Uh, but if you read this, what he said was, we've lost the war over slavery, but what we must now do is fight against consolidation, which was the vernacular of the time for big government. And we, can, we must continue to fight that war of ideas. It's as if Lee Atwater or Roger Ailes had written this. It's remarkable. It's exactly what that strategy was for a very long time. And the president who is most like the incumbent was Andrew Johnson. It was not Andrew Jackson. I, I knew Andrew Jackson. <laughs> Andrew Jackson was a friend of mine. So if you got Boo Radley, you were certainly going to get Lloyd Benson. <laughs> That was, a, that was a safe bet. Quick parenthetical story about, about the Jackson thing. So Trump, I, I went to interview uh, the candidate in um, May of 16. Uh, went to Trump Tower. Uh, I was going to, I was on assignment for Time Magazine. My job was to find out what he was reading. Uh, I could have kept my Uber. Uh, but... Anyway, it was not my most illuminating hour, <laughs> I must say. But Jackson never came up. Uh, and so then right after the election, the man I now refer to as the late Steve Bannon uh, put, uh, put Jackson in the vernacular. Uh, Trump hung the portrait in the Oval Office. And in m March of 17, he's coming down to Nashville, where I live, to lay a wreath at the Hermitage, Andrew Jackson's house in um, in Nashville. And whenever presidents talk about their predecessors, always listen carefully because they see as they wish to be seen. There's all, they're always seeking sanction. When Jack Kennedy said, uh, this is the greatest gathering of talent since Thomas Jefferson dined alone with, to the Nobel Prize people, what he was really saying was, aren't I like Thomas Jefferson to think to invite all the Nobel Prize winners here? Uh, so it's always revealing when they talk about their predecessors. So he was coming down, and I was sitting at home thinking I should do something. So I decided to write an open letter to the president saying that if you're going to embrace Jackson, don't just embrace the crazy parts. And there are plenty of crazy parts to embrace, as you know. Jackson once said that his only two regrets in public life were that he had not hung Henry Clay and shot John C. Calhoun, who was his own vice president. <laughs> we now know that no one felt that way about their running mate until John McCain, actually. But... <laughs> Anyway. anyway, I do bar mitzvahs too if you need me. Uh, but, 
So I wrote this. So if you're going to embrace Jackson, he, he believed in the Union. He believed we were one great family for all his manifold sins and, and, and problems. And he was a great negotiator. So I wrote this as a letter to the president saying, welcome to Tennessee, but this is the Jackson you should embrace, not just the, the outlandish one. And it ran. It was the entire front page of the local newspaper. It had no effect whatever, of course. But, and this is just parenthetically, so the next day I'm walking into lunch and my telephone rings, and it's my most recent subject. It was George H.W. Bush. True story. And uh, he spent a lot of that winter in the hospital, so his staff was giving him things to read. They give him a copy of this. And so I answer the phone, naturally, and he says, how you doing? And I said, I'm fine, Mr. President, how are you? Uh, the key to doing uh, George H.W. Bush's voice, by the way, as Dana Carvey once said, is Mr. Rogers trying to be John Wayne. <laughs> and so I said, hey, yeah. I said, I'm not going to do it. So I said, I'm fine, sir, how are you? He said, I'm fine. He said, I read your, <clears throat> he said, I read your letter to Jackson. I thought, oh, shit, you know, the old boy's losing it, right? I mean, he's seven, he was 93 at the time, and he thinks I'm writing letters to dead people. This probably isn't good. So I said, thank you, Mr. President. Um, you know, actually, it was a letter to Trump about Jackson. And without missing a beat, the old man said, yeah, but Jackson will pay more attention. <laughs> um, so he's fine. No problem. No problem. Uh, so back to Andrew Johnson. It's a long way around. But uh, Johnson was, did not have a natural political base in Washington. He was a Democrat. He'd been put on Lincoln's ticket to broaden the appeal in the 1864 election. By the way, when you despair, and I know you're going to before the night is out, uh, remember, in 1864, we had a commander-in-chief who, in the midst of an armed rebellion for the existence of the nation, held a competitive, full and fair presidential election with every anticipation of accepting the result. Lincoln thought he was going to lose and was ready, had started wor working on transition papers, actually. And so we've, we've been at tough moments. We've, we've come through. Uh, so Johnson's put on the ticket to broaden the appeal. He immediately reverts to type after Ford's theater. Uh, he opposes the civil rights legislation. He opposes the 14th and 15th Amendments. He opposes the Freedmen's Bureau. He fires generals whom he believes are being overly uh, conciliatory toward the newly emancipated. It's a total disaster. He, was, uh, he issued what Eric Foner called the most racist statement in the history of the presidency, saying that, that blacks were congenitally incapable of self-government and therefore had to be wards of the state. That was in an annual message of the president of the United States. So, you know, just put it in context, all right? 1920s. Uh, does any of this sound familiar? The economy is shifting from an agrarian to an industrial world. There's enormous white working class anxiety about immigrants and uh, both uh, Jewish immigrants, Roman Catholic immigrants, Asian immigrants in the West Coast. Terrible fears about a yellow peril coming. Uh, there were senators who warned that California to the Rockies was going to become a yellow empire. Uh, this, was, this was front and center, mainstream everyday newspaper talk. 1915, after the release of The Birth of a Nation, uh, D.W. Griffin's movie about the Ku Klux Klan and Reconstruction, the Klan is refounded at Stone Mountain, Georgia in, uh, in uh, uh, Sunday after Thanksgiving. It rises to con comprise three to five million Americans. The governors of Colorado, Oregon, Texas, Georgia, and Indiana were members of the Klan. There were as many as 16 senators who were members of the Klan, as many as 30 members of the House. 50,000 Klansmen marched down Pennsylvania Avenue in 1925. The 1924 Democratic National Convention had 347 Klan delegates that drove the convention to 103 ballots because they would not vote for Al Smith, who's an Irish Catholic. Rough, rough moment. How do we get through it? There are really only five elements in the American contract that we have to, de to decide great public moment, matters of great public moment. The presidency, the Congress, the courts, the press, and the people themselves, all of us. As long as two or three of those forces are rowing in the right direction, we tend to be okay. And what happened in the 20s was there was restrictive immigration legislation, which capped, uh, took a lot of the oxygen out of it. Immigration caps, by the way, which were not lifted until 1965, so for 41 years. 
But Harding and Coolidge did the right thing. Uh, they spoke out against the Klan. The courts issued two important, the Supreme Court issued two important decisions. One upheld a New York law that said the Klan had to publish the names of its members because it was engaging in vigilante violence. The Klan had argued, we're like the Kiwanis Club, this violates our First Amendment. The court said no. Uh, the other was a fascinating case out in Oregon, where as an attempt to shut down Catholic parochial schools, which were seen as hotbeds of immigrants and foreignism and uh, evil uh, cabals against the United States, they, uh, a Klan-dominated legislature passed a law saying that every child had to go to public school. You couldn't go to private school. Supreme Court struck that down. It was a direct attack on the Roman Catholic Church. So the courts did the right thing. The president did the right thing. The press did the right thing. The people were kind of mixed on it, honestly. But that was one where the institutions worked. By, and, and God, thank God it did. Because if we had come into the cataclysm of 1932-33 with three to five million people as a kind of fascistic shock troop, then it's unclear whether Franklin Roosevelt could have accomplished what he accomplished and actually saved democratic capitalism. And we forget, you know, Roosevelt looms so large over, over all of our lives, as does Mrs. Roosevelt. It was an open question about whether the republic would endure past the 1930s. FDR said the two most dangerous men in America were Huey Long and Douglas MacArthur, because Long could lead a pop's revolt from the left and MacArthur from the right. There were one out of four Americans were out of work. One of the best-selling books of the decade was written by Anne Morrow Lindbergh, Charles Lindbergh's wife. It was called The Wave of the Future. And in her view, the wave of the future was not democratic capitalism, but was European-style totalitarianism because, and does this sound at all familiar, because the 18th century constitutional system was archaic, the world was moving too fast, the threats of foreign powers, both on the economic and military fronts, required a strong man who would take over the presidency and rule with a rod of iron. Sounds a lot like I alone can fix it, doesn't it? What happened? Franklin Roosevelt pointed ahead at the horizon instead of at other Americans. He got Japanese internment woefully wrong. So did the young Attorney General of California named Earl Warren who recommended Japanese-American internment. But we have to judge the past on its totality, I think, in the way we would want to be judged. And Franklin Roosevelt emphasized hope over fear. And that's what characterizes the great eras that we want to commemorate and emulate and that have the most to teach us. Finally, McCarthy, uh, which is arguably the closest analogy, uh, not least because Joe McCarthy and the incumbent had the same lawyer. Sometimes you don't even have to make this up, all right? <laughs> so uh, Roy Cohn wrote a really interesting book about Joe McCarthy, uh, basically laying out why he thought McCarthy had failed, and it is richly resonant. McCarthy was an opportunist. He was a freelance political performer. He totally understood the media of the day. He understood wire deadlines. What he would do is he would call in the afternoon papers at 11.30 in the morning because they all had to close at noon to be out at 2. He would say, I'm seeking a communist in Des Moines. And then they didn't have time to check it. So, but a United States senator was saying there was a communist in Des Moines, so they had to publish it. So they flashed across the country all these headlines, Red Hunt in Des Moines. Then about 11.30 p.m., because the morning papers closed about midnight, he would say, they have eluded me so far, but I'm redoubling my efforts. Flash around the country, people woke up to McCarthy redoubles efforts to seek red in Des Moines. He never found one. But the hunt was all. The show was all. He bought anti-communism, Roy Cohn himself said, as the way the rest of us might buy a used car. He was looking for a vehicle for fame and influence. And he was a narcissistic man and un understood what made a good show. But here's what happened. People got tired of it. Franklin Roosevelt said there's something in the human psychology that cannot stand to have the highest note in the register played all the time. 
And I think that's right. It is the McCarthy also fell partly because he ran out of wore out his welcome in the new medium. McCarthy began with radio and print newspapers, and he was done in by television. There were 5.1 million televisions in American homes when McCarthy spoke at Wheeling, West Virginia on Lincoln's birthday, 1950. When he was censured by the United States Senate the first week of December, 1954, there were 30.6 million. It had grown that fast. People had watched the Army McCarthy hearings. They had not liked what they had seen. They thought, that's not who we want to be. And they turned on him. Here's the thing. Margaret Chase Smith knew this in the beginning. Republican Senator from Maine gave a speech the first couple of weeks after McCarthy started called the Declaration of Conscience, laying out the entire case against McCarthy as we would understand it. Violates rule of law, fair play, it's un-American. She only got six co-signers in 1950. McCarthy dismissed them as Snow White and the Six Dwarves. But by 1954, everybody was with her. So what I say is, when I have the chance to talk to lawmakers now, I say, do you want to be Margaret Chase Smith? Or do you want to be those 90 senators that took four years to get to the right answer? So it's a question worth asking when you're talking to people who, who seek office. I know that uh, this is cold comfort, but remember that even at our very best, we've only gotten it right 51% of the time. If we had been standing here in July of 1968, exactly 50 years ago, in the lifetime of almost everyone here, 46 Americans would have died in Vietnam. Not wounded, would have been killed. We would have just buried Senator Kennedy. We would have just buried Dr. King. President Johnson would have just gotten out of the race. There would have been the riots after Dr. King's assassination. We would be heading into the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. And on Election Day in November, George Wallace of Alabama would win five states and 13.5% of the vote on an explicitly segregationist platform in the lifetime of everyone here. So my message is not, it's happened before, so relax. It's that it's happened before, and singular people, many of whose names are lost to us, stood up and said, we want to be something different. We don't want our worst instincts to define our generation. They did it with persistence and resistance. Women's suffrage is not yet 100 years old. It's only been three years since gay Americans were allowed to marry. Within, the fi within 55 years in my native region, we lived under functional apartheid. When people tell John Lewis things had never been worse, he said, I used to get beaten by policemen in the street for wanting to vote. That was pretty bad. Because that was bad doesn't mean this is good. But because that was survivable does mean that this is survivable. And remember, if I'm right that everything is, that there's a basic arc and that we have a disposition of heart and mind that puts us on the right side of history just enough of the time, then that flow of power embodied in the document drafted here that is from the hands of the few to the hands of the many is our saving grace, because to whom much is given, much is expected. Thank you. Not that you would, but if you wrote a biography of Donald Trump, right. you, called Arnold, uh, you called Jackson an American lion. What would be your tagline for him? Uh, well, it would have to be less than 140 characters. Uh, I don't know yet. Um, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Uh, I don't know that there, there's not any mystery here, right? I mean, it's all there. Um, it's just that you have 45% of the country, uh, really, 30, McCarthy's approval rating after he fell 
was still 34%. So look, if they take him back to Moscow in handcuffs, he's going to have 35% of the country with it. He is. He is. He is. It's just, it's just the way. And you know what? You, you shouldn't be all that upset about it because disagreement is the oxygen of democracy. It's, that 35% has every right to believe this. You don't, and you have every right to do that and to try to convince them. But this is a fight for the middle 20, really. Uh, I call them 401k Trumpers right now <laughs> because the, they, the, they're checking their statement. It's fine, so they're, they're just rocking along with it. Um, I hope that this is a, uh, a chapter in the American story where a lot of forces that have been perennial found their, their very vivid expression and that ultimately the conventions of politics, which I think ha have, a, have a real reason for being, will reassert themselves fairly quickly, I think. Um, but I didn't think you'd be president, so what the hell do I know? <laughs> There's a lot of controversy about the uh, Electoral College. Yeah. And um, some people will spout that they're fans of the Founding Fathers, but then they don't understand that. I'd like to hear your opinion on, uh, first of all, if they, I thought that they might stop Trump, uh, but the, the fact that they didn't, yeah. what's your position on the Electoral College? Should we it's a really that? interesting question. Um, the first thing I'll say is that the only way to get significant electoral college reform is going to be if we have two presidential elections where the Republicans win the popular vote but lose the presidency. <laughs> Once that happens, we'll have a conversation. <laughs> right now, they're 2-0, and o and they, don't see, they, they think that James Madison is brilliant right now. Um, I agree with you. Uh, my view of what, of what Madison had in mind was that the... I know this, uh, the Electoral College was supposed to be a fully deliberative body. Right? It wasn't supposed to be an algorithm. It was, they were supposed to come and look at the candidates and choose who they thought was best. For a whole host of reasons, that never happened. So you have this interesting vestigial Rubik's Cube uh, that uh, does not represent the popular will. In that sense, the way the system works right now is in keeping with what the founders had in mind because they were trying to check that popular will in the choice of the first magistrate, as, the, as they called him. Um, I, I've never been an elector, unlikely I will be. Uh, I like to think that if I were, I would find the capacity to, uh, to have been a faithless elector, as they call them, uh, because you could do it. I mean, I, I guess you could litigate it, but it's, it's un unclear how, you, how that would happen. Um, but right now, I don't think it's going anywhere. And so I think the way to do it is find out who your electors are, uh, first of all, and see if they're actually people who, in extremis, might, uh, might stand up and do the right thing. I'm an eternal optimist, and I tend to agree with you that we'll make it through this particular process. But one of the things that strikes me as being different uh, about now than the previous examples you give is that we have an atomic bomb and that there is very little between the president and the use of that. That's true. Um, and also there is the rapid growth of everybody knowing everything all the time mm -hmm. and being able to live in a world where they hear nothing but their own interests and thoughts reflect back. Yeah. And that's very different. I thought, wonder what you thought about that. Yeah, I'll, I, I'm totally with you on the first. Um, remember Earl Long, the uh, governor of Louisiana, um, was asked at one point why he was giving in to a federal court order. He said, what the hell are we going to do now that the feds have the bomb and how they can use it? So um, I think that's a very serious question. And uh, it's what I thought would have thought would have been dispositive uh, in the fall of 2016. Um, I have talked to people who know a lot more about this than I do, who are not concerned that there can be a temper, who believe that there would not be a situation where a totally irrational launch could happen. I think that, uh, I think that steps, perhaps unconstitutional but necessary, uh, have been taken inside the government. I don't know that, but I think so. I think so. Uh, so that's one thing. So reassure there, it's fine, right? 
his button, they actually just, they just cut the cord on his button. Um, so that's one. Um, the second thing, I, I challenge you a little bit on, on, on the, oh, wait, the second point, which is a, a very widespread uh, view and has a lot to it. What I would say, though, is for the 18th and 19th and into the first, say, 20 years of the 20th century, you could live in that same bubble. And in fact, newspapers were all partisan. They were all represented certain party views. That didn't change until really the 1908, 1909. Partly it was the progressive era's interest in uh, data. Uh, secondly, it was a market proposition from Adolf Ox of the New York Times, who there were 40 newspapers in New York when he bought the Times in 1896. So every possible political thing was covered. So his motto, without fear or favor, was a market proposition. That he, all right, I'll, be the, I'll be the, what we would now call an aggregator. I'll be the place where you can just come and find out what's going on. And that model won out as the century went on. It was, uh, the process was ratified, validated, and helped along by the invention by radio and television because there was something called the fairness doctrine. Uh, the public airwaves belong to all of us, and so therefore, if you took, prior to 1986, if you took a political stand on radio or TV, you had to give equal time to the other person. And so therefore, most pl places just stayed away from it. Uh, as part of a generalized regulatory, deregulatory action in 1986, President Reagan repealed that. That's when talk radio took off. Uh, that's when Rush Limbaugh went national in 1988 was powerful enough by 92 that his support of Pat Buchanan nearly toppled Bush in, in New Hampshire. And that gave you Fox News in 1996, and, and the rest is, is, is our reality right now. But if you were a uh, Confederate-leaning planter in the Old South, you only got newspapers you agreed with, and I promise you only talked to people who agreed with you. And uh, so I, I think that that's a perennial, it doesn't mean it's not an, a, an issue, but it, it's a perennial one. And we have managed to use that, those gifts of reason to try to get out of those bubbles in the past. Uh, John, thank you so much. And uh, that's been a very powerful presentation. And I uh, really admire your optimism that uh, if you have gone through this before, we'll get over it again. There's usually a but coming. Of course there is. <laughs> I was born in Kenya and grew up in Kenya, and we always read about a great America which respected everybody, respected liberty. We always wanted to go there, it was almost like going to heaven, you know? Right. You get here, you start getting that history you talked about, and it's not all that great. And then you live here 20 years later, and you start feeling, how did we get here? You look at the TV, is he really the president? Yeah. And then you realize, there's something called democracy. And democracy is about numbers. That he may be the voice of a large number of people who voted for him. Maybe the people next to me, the people living with me, the people in the same restaurant, in the same school. He is representing them, not the America I read about. And I get scared of your optimism. Because you talked about the five institutions, the presidency, the Congress, yep. the judiciary the press, the people. If the people have failed, if the press is not there, if there's new Fox 4 News, I get very worried. I wish you can justify your optimism. I wish I can be, walk out of here feeling more optimistic because every single day I get more worried. Thank you. Yeah. All right, in the spirit of this city, in the spirit of, of a full and frank exchange, I'm going to take a risk here and say, I understand what you're saying. It is also true that if you were visiting me in Nashville and it were 50 years ago, you couldn't be in this room. Right? So as bleak as things are, we have built by hook and by crook, a system that brought you here. When did you move? When did you move? In 1997. In 1997, okay. So there was 
something about the United States that brought you here. And you're not leaving. Right? You're scared. Sca well, hell, we're all scared. <laughs> Jesus. We're all scared. That's fine. That's why we have Xanax. Um, no. Um, I understand. Believe me. I totally understand. I, I, I get it. Uh, I, I have a very hard time explaining this. I have a 16-year-old, a 13-year-old, a 10-year-old. I have a very hard time explaining how this happened. Um, if I have to explain to my 10-year-old one more time that Stormy Daniels is a weather reporter. <laughs> uh, so... But... Um, all I would say is this. If there were, there were an incredible, for most of American history, you would have been more scared than you are now because your, your fundamental civil liberties and political liberties would not have existed. We now live in a country where only, what, 19 months ago, a man named Barack Hussein Obama was president of the United States. Right? So... If things, if, if, I just think there's more evidence to support the idea that if we continue to speak up, if we continue to be honest about our fears, we'll pull through it. It's not going to be easy, but it never has been. The country that was created by 1997 was created by people who stood up when it wasn't popular to do so. Rosa Parks had not stood up on December 1st, 1955, a whole series of essential steps and progress might not have happened. And there was a woman working as a seamstress at a department store who just said, you know what, I'm not going to do it anymore. And that's what we all have to do every day. How do you see the, the latest addition to the Supreme Court falling yeah. into your, yeah. your explanation at the end and, and your optimism? Sure. Uh, Look, Judge Kavanaugh and Judge Gorsuch were, would both have been put on the court if John Kasich had become president, if Rubio had become president, if Jeb Bush had become president. This, this, that's, a Repub that's a quarrel with the Republican Party. That's not a quarrel with Trump. Uh, in fact, remember he put that list out because everybody was afraid he was going to put Judge Judy on. <laughs> and... He's the only judge he knew, you know. <laughs> so, and maybe that'd be better. Hell, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I, but uh, but that, that's, that's an ebb and flow of presidential elections. And um, so I, if, he, if he were putting someone who was clearly not qualified, then that would be a different, a different thing. But this, that's somebody, you can argue all you want about that, but that, that's a, someone from the heart of the conservative movement. And, uh, and let me just go ahead and tell you, he's going to get confirmed. It, it, it's, it, it's important. I mean, there was, because of the 12 years of, uh, this is what you get when you talk to me, because of, the, because of Harding, Coolidge, Hoover, you had a court in the 30s, remember, why did FDR want to pack the court? because those were a bunch of Republican justices. And then that falls apart after, in 37, they start, actuarially, they start dying, they start uh, uh, leaving, so that you had a turn, so that when Earl Warren became chief, here's an interesting detail, when Earl Warren became chief justice of the United States in 1954, every justice on the court had been appointed by FDR or Truman. There was not a Republican justice on the court. And that's the court that gave us the remarkable work of the 50s. And what we have now is, and I, I, for better or for worse, it totally reflects the presidential elections of the past 30 years because there's one justice from George Herbert Walker Bush, there are two from Clinton, two from W, two from Obama, and now two from Trump. And so that's, that's a mirror of, of, of these elections and how they turn out. Driving back this morning from Baltimore at 90 miles an hour on 95, 
I was listening to the audio of the most recent episode of a TV show you're familiar with, Real Time with Bill Maher. Yeah. And Maher and Michael Moore were talking about the fact well, that... Well, quickly, why were you driving so fast? <laughs> I had to take my pugs to the vet and then get here. So it was a busy day. Are your day. parents here? My mother is. Why are you letting him do that? <laughs> Did you know this? Dad, all right. Um, you got a long ride home, buddy. It, it was. Um, and uh, Mar and uh, Michael Moore were talking about the fact that optimism right now for November is not only bad, but dangerous. Yeah, yeah. And I started thinking about the fact that the last three of the four national elections have really been based on the party that wins is the one that is angry and a lot of resentment culturally and ethnically. And I was wondering about the fact, not these key moments in American history you've talked about tonight, but just in general national politics of the last 200, almost 40 years, how many are based on the better yeah. angels versus pessimism and resentment? Well, no, walk me through, the, sorry, so you think three out of the last four presidential elections? Not presidential, just national. Uh, oh, 2010, okay. Well, midterm, and midterms 16. are always a bar fight. Okay. Um, uh, because they're, they're based, the base is turning out, they're mad because they lost before. Um, Lyndon Johnson won the largest electoral landslide in American history in 1964. In 1966, 1,000 days, the same amount of time that separated uh, Kennedy's inauguration from Dallas. Uh, Johnson says, and when he's uh, sworn in in 1966, that these are the most hopeful times in the history of the world since Bethlehem which gives you some sense of how he saw himself. Um, 1966, they, I think the Republicans won 50 or 60 seats, and Ronald Reagan becomes governor of California, and the, counter, and the reaction sets in. So there's also something in the American spirit that bounces us from guardrail to guardrail. So I'm about to describe the Star Wars bar scene meets C-SPAN, right? So George Herbert Walker Bush, to Bill Clinton, totally different people. Bill Clinton to George W. Bush, totally different size of the baby boom. I never thought I would see as different a temperamental shift for, as we saw from Bush to Obama until, which means if I'm right, if that's true, then we may get Aristotle next. <laughs> so, um, better. Um, so, so, so midterm elections are like this. Uh, what I would argue, and I, I won't torture you all, it would be like being trapped at Guantanamo if I went through it, but I would argue that if you went back, let's just, we could even just do the 20th century, um, the presidential candidate who wins, the, who actually gets to the White House, more, far more often than not is someone who is offering an affirmative vision. There's always the other, of course. That's the nature of the, of the game. But the people we remember, the people we want to commemorate, the people who trip off the tongue, are essentially people who looked forward and not just around them. And it's not just because somehow or another they're good people, it's that they understand that people like us are gonna read books about them and talk about them and hope they're a monument to them if they build instead of tear down. And that may sound homiletic, it may sound sentimental, I, I don't mean it that way at all. It's just a purely practical uh, political insight that presidents endure who build. And if you only tear down, if you only belittle, if you only tend to your campfire, then only your campfire is gonna remember you fondly. And I promise you, I've spent, I've been lucky in my life, I've spent a lot of time around these people. Uh, <laughs> um, all of them, all of them. He said what? You know, no, all of them. I probably, they sit around all the time thinking about how we're gonna remember them. And it starts the moment the second term starts, usually, I swear. And so maybe that, I, I hadn't thought of it in terms of, in terms of the incumbent. He, if I had five minutes with him, 
what I would say is, what do you want us to think when we look at your oil portrait? Which he would like, because he can't imagine a world where we're not gazing at his oil portrait. <laughs> but there's no, there's no reason not to argue uh, to someone's vanity if that's what's there, and if that's what works. Um, I'm thinking about the gentleman's question earlier and his comment about being afraid and your response that we're all afraid. And I agree with that, but I also think that you're a white man talking to a black immigrant. And that yeah. feels different. And I think about how I'm afraid of this new Supreme Court justice. Um, but meanwhile, we've had the Hyde Amendment that Roe yeah. v. Wade may as well not exist. And right. I think about the fact that 40% of homeless youth or more are trans. And I just wonder about, you know, yes, maybe this doesn't feel like fascism to you or to me, but what America will survive? Is this like the, oh, yeah. the frog in boiling water? Well, it won't feel like us it to us, but it's, it's headed somewhere that we don't necessarily, or that the people who aren't us won't survive that America. Great question, great question. Um, no, I'm, look, and I'm fully aware that as, as a straight, white, southern, boringly heterosexual man, uh, I, but you, you, look, I admit it, here I am. You know, you take it or leave it. Uh, this is my argument, uh, accept or, or not. Um, I believe this as much as I believe anything. In 20 years' time, this country is going to look a lot more like Barack Obama's America than Donald Trump's. And because, because if anything, I think the 2016 election, the ferocity of the backlash to the demographic cultural changes that you allude to that are inevitable, that are changing the country rapidly, I think for the better, myself, but many people who voted for the Republican nominee do not think it's for better. This is in many ways an affirmation, as weird as that sounds, of the inevitability of that trend. This is the last stand of largely a white supremacist worldview. And so I totally get that I totally understand that there are rights and conventions of life and customs and, and opportunities that, that feel under siege or are taken away. I totally understand that. My role in being here, my role in writing this, is to urge people to citizen action because at every point in our history, politicians, not at every point, Politicians have, by and large, been mirrors of who we are, not molders. And so they have to look out and see the kind of world you're talking about. And that's the essential thing. Uh, there are moments where presidents, I focused on presidents in this because I thought, you know what, maybe if we talk to people who are on the other side of this divide and we show them that people from both parties have done better at this, maybe that has a chance of widening the aperture of argument. And so I totally get it. Um, I just think that we have done the right thing before, and if we know that it was a close run thing then, we know it's gonna be a close run thing now, and we have to get to work. This is not a prayer, this book. This is a plan. Thank you. Um, you alluded to the kind of person that would be the next president uh, when you mentioned Aristotle. I'm wondering if you could get a little more specific and, and uh, <laughs> you don't think, reference you don't think he's available? who you think might be up and coming leaders in the Democratic Party that we could look to in the oh, future. Oh, I, I think, uh, yeah, Aristotle doesn't have a reality show, so he's probably not gonna, not gonna make it. Um, I, think it's, I think you saw it the other night. Um, with the rally at the Supreme Court opposing the nominee. Uh, it looked like a, it, 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 everything except a cow from Iowa, right? <laughs> there was Sanders, there was Booker, there was Harris, there was Warren. That's, that's, what's, that's where things are going. I don't think the Democrats are gonna want a, uh, I could be wrong, uh, I don't think a centrist figure is gonna get the nomination. I think that these issues that we're talking about are so deeply felt right now that their view is going to be you have to fight fire with fire. And so I think we're going to have a ferociously tribal presidential election in 2020. 
It's going to be about turning out every possible person. And that'll be the fight. And uh, I think, let me put it this way, I would rather be a Democrat than a Republican these days because the Democrats know who they are. The Republicans, if the Republicans are truly are who they, they profess to be, that's a bad place to be. Uh, no one's ever seen numbers. The, the approval rating, the president's approval rating among self-described Republicans is off the charts. It, it can be as high as 90% in some red states. George W. Bush didn't touch that after 9-11. It's this, it's this, it's what we were talking about. It's, it's this, we've got to take a last stand here. That's what's driving it. But not every Republican is like that. It's just that I think that a lot of, and I say this to my friends who have done it, I think a lot of Republicans sold their soul for a tax cut, Supreme Court justices, and deregulation. And I don't know if it's worth it. I don't know if it was worth it. And you can hiss if you're the, the random Republican, but tell me what else is, is on offer. Ladies and gentlemen, John Meacham. Thanks.